Good morning. And welcome to North Roanoke. It's good to see you today on this Lord's Day. And hopefully everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And of course, when we give thanks, we are giving thanks to our God, who is the giver of all good gifts. And so that spirit of thankfulness brings us into this season of Advent, which is hard to believe. Every year it comes about the same time, and every year I'm always surprised. I don't know about you, but Christmas comes up on us, and even though it's the last Sunday in November, we are beginning the season of Advent, so in just a little while, we'll have our Advent reading, but before we uh, get to that part of the service, I'd like to start with just one brief psalm. This comes from Psalm 89, verse 1, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make known our God's faithfulness to all generations. And while we do that, we're going to go tell it on the mountain to all who will listen to us that Jesus Christ is born. Would you stand? Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and every Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone. At this time, the Ecclestons will come and read our first Advent candle reading of the season. This is David and Kathy Eccleston. And uh, as we give thanks to our God for his many good gifts, I think it's appropriate for us to have thankful hearts that uh, not only is Kathy able to be here with us worshiping, but she's able to help lead in worship because If you remember, she had quite a battle uh, several months back. So, Kathy, we are so grateful that you are here. And, David, we're glad for you, too. So, the Ecclestons. Today we begin celebrating Advent by lighting the candle of prophecy. Advent means coming and reminds us of the Hebrews who awaited the arrival of the Messiah, as well as our own waiting for his glorious return. The first candle reminds us of the promise given in the Old Testament that a Messiah would come. 
This promise was given many years before the miraculous event came to pass. Jesus did not come to earth unannounced, and we didn't only hear of him when the angels told Mary she would be with child. Many prophets in the Old Testament spoke numerous prophecies that pointed to the surety of his coming and stated what his coming would do for all those who would call upon his name. One of those prophets, Isaiah, tells us, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord. There is no other explanation for how our Savior, Jesus, came into this world humbling himself and taking on the form of a mere man. This story wasn't written when Mary, Mary supernaturally became pregnant, nor was it written when the prophets began foretelling it. This magnificent story wasn't composed after rebellion of Adam and Eve and who engineered such a rescue mission. It didn't originate in man's imagination. Not even a prophet could have come up with such a plot. And even if a person could have thought up such a scenario, no man could have possessed the power necessary to bring it about. No. This story was written by God our Father before the foundations of the earth were fashioned by his mighty hand. God made a way for us to be reconciled to himself. This is the greatest story ever told. In the first century, Augustine encouraged us to rejoice when he wrote, let the, joy, let the just rejoice for their justifier is born. Let the sick and infirm rejoice for their savior is born. Let the captives rejoice for their redeemer is born. Let the slaves rejoice, for their master is born. Let the free rejoice, for their liberator is born. Let all Christians rejoice, for Christ, Jesus Christ is born. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your greatness. God, we thank you for your sovereignty and your uh, being able to know that before you ever created us or the world, that we would need a savior. Lord, we thank you for the miraculous plan that you came up with, that you designed. No man could ever have done it. And Lord, we thank you for all that you do and thank you for providing a way for us to have salvation and to be reconciled back to you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. David and Kathy, what an awesome opportunity uh, to see you read and lead us in worship today. If you are a guest at North Roanoke, we want to extend a special welcome to you. There's a green welcome card in the pew rack in front of you. If you'd be so kind as to let us know of your visit, we'd love to have the opportunity to see what God's up to in your life and how we might come alongside of you and be a part of that. There are black boxes at either entrance and exit to the sanctuary. If you just drop that in there and let that be your offering to us, we'd be so thankful and Speaking of offerings, I want to remind you that uh, we continue to give and give generously. We've got just a few more weeks to go, really, in 2021. It's hard to believe. Sometimes I feel like it's still March of 2020. Uh, when COVID hit, it just kind of like big pause button, but time is marching on. And uh, the ministry needs of North Roanoke continue and the opportunity to invest in our community and to uh, impact lives even in places like Malawi because we support missionaries like Matt and Catherine who are serving there, uh, lifting high the name of Jesus and planting a church and uh, equipping disciples uh, there in Malawi. Uh, our ties and offerings are making an impact locally and globally and everywhere in between. So I want to encourage you, North Roanoke Family of Faith, whether you're here in the room, in the gym, or over the live stream, uh, please continue to give and give generously. It's easy to do it. You can put a check in the box, you can use the app, you can go online, you can bring a check by the church office, however uh, you would like to give, we encourage you to continue to do so. And with that in mind, I'd like to, to pray uh, for our time together and for our tithes and offerings. Would you join me? God in heaven, thank you that Jesus Christ is born. Thank you that we have a story to tell. Thank you for the gift of Christmas. 
And God, we've just celebrated Thanksgiving. Thank you for the, the gift of thanks, Lord, that, that you have sent Christ, that we know of our great need for him, and we know of the great Savior that he is. And God, through Christ, we, we can delight in your goodness. We can know how great you are and how deeply you have saved us. God, if there's anyone here or listening online that is, that is far from God, that doesn't know that they know that you are their Savior, God, I pray that even today might be the day of salvation, that you would draw some to saving faith in Christ. And Lord, for our missionaries in Malawi and our, our missionaries serving around the world and across this country, God, we pray that you would give them grace during this season. I know many are away from their families, God, during the Christmas season, and that's hard for them. God, we pray that you would be near to them, God, that you would give them gospel fruit, that they would see you uh, on the move and on the advance through the work and the labor of their hands and the witness of their mouths. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have just a couple lessons in the faith left for this year. And today our question asks, where is Christ now? So let's read aloud our answer together. Christ rose bodily from the grave on the third day after his death and is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling his kingdom and interceding for us until he returns to judge and renew the whole world. Amen. Would you stand? We'll continue to sing.
I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all What a great song, what a great opportunity to know 
the maker of heaven and earth as your God. If you sang those words today, but you don't know that God is your God, I, I pray that after about 30 minutes or maybe 300 minutes of the sermon, just kidding, um, that, that you might know God as your God. We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 1 and we'll continue through verse 10 in a, a message that I've titled, In the Name of Jesus, Rise Up and Walk. In the Name of Jesus, Rise Up and Walk. Last week we saw at the end of Luke chapter 2, some of the distinctive characteristics of a community of believers that has been created by the Holy Spirit's application of the life of Christ to their lives. We see them being together in the Word of God. We see them being together around their tables and in prayer. We see their generosity and their sacrifice supporting one another. And, and as they do these things, they're not stressed but blessed. They have hearts of extreme joy and simplicity as they share in one another's lives. They're eating together, praising God, and, and praying daily. These Jews have been rescued by the king that they killed. Israelites who'd been scattered from among every nation under heaven are, have now been reunited under their king in Jerusalem. And the promise that signs and wonders that would be worked among God's people before the day of the Lord are being fulfilled in their midst as the apostles we saw in verse 43 work wonders and signs and fear comes upon the city the awe of God comes upon Jerusalem and now today and as we turn the page to chapter 3 we sort of unzip verse 43 which tells us that wonders and signs are being performed by the apostles, if we, if we can sort of expand that verse and say, well, what does that look like? That's the question that, that Luke answers for us in verses 1 through 10 of, of chapter 3. Would you hear with me the word of the Lord? Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple, and you, you can't do anything but go up to the temple because it's elevated. So from every side, you've got to go up to the temple. They were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, about 3 p.m. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately... His feet and ankles were made strong, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Would you bow with me? God, for anyone within the sound of my voice today who is not walking with God, who is spiritually lame, God, I pray by way of your Holy Spirit and the hearing of your word that you would reach their heart and that you would change them and heal them. And God, for any who's lost the wonder and the amazement of the salvation that you have brought, God, I pray that you would renew it to them today. That for some, that you would restore the joy of their salvation. God, you're an amazing healer. You're, you're an amazing restorer and a, an amazing God. And I, I pray that we would see and understand that more today. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The apostles are said in verse 43 of chapter 2, to have worked many miracles. But Luke selects this one as, a, as an example. 
The language that Peter uses, rise up and walk, is familiar Bible language. It reminds us of Luke chapter 5. Do you remember the paralytic that's brought to Jesus by his friends and they claw down through the roof to get the paralytic lowered to Jesus? And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. And they're like, what? We didn't bring him for his sins to be forgiven. We just want the guy to walk. And by the way, who are you to forgive sins? And Jesus is, of course, God, so he can forgive sins. But nevertheless, they're still learning. And while they're processing in their minds, why in the world did he forgive sins rather than heal the guy? Jesus says, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? You know how the story goes. He goes, proceeds to heal him. Why? To prove that Jesus can do the harder thing, that he can forgive sin because he's God. So Luke picks a miracle out of all the miracles that the apostles were working there in Jerusalem. He picks a miracle that parallels the particular miracle of Jesus in Luke 5, where he gives not just physical healing, but also forgiveness. This is not accidental. What happens in the man's life physically in this miracle we've just read about is a picture of what God can do in the life of anyone spiritually who will turn from their sin and trust in Him and be healed of their spiritual lameness. In Acts 1, Luke told us that he had written about in in his gospel, the gospel of Luke, that he had written about the work that Jesus had begun to do, which implies that there's still work for Jesus to do and he's going to do it and he's done it right here in Acts 3 1 through 10 through the apostles who are witnesses to these Israelites of the power of God and the reality that their king has come and is reigning so Peter and John they they go to the temple at the ninth hour around three o'clock in the afternoon for the second of three hours of prayer there Although Jesus had already said that the temple would be destroyed and that he is the temple, the apostles keep going to the temple as long as they can. Why? To bear witness to King Jesus. They go there hoping, as Peterson says, that other Jews might be spared the coming judgment and that they might share in the blessings of the messianic era that has been started in King Jesus. He continues, the temple area remained important, an important context for their witness until the apostles and the church were excluded from it by mounting opposition to the gospel. And as Peter and John are about to go into the temple, what happens to them that day? They have an encounter. They have an encounter with a man who was lame from birth. He's sitting there, lying there in the dust, begging for alms for money. But he leaves with something much greater than money. He leaves that day with the transformative restoration of his body. Christ, working through his apostles, is proving that his kingdom has come and the renewal of all things has already begun in Christ. And the first thing that we see in this text that I want to share with you this morning, it's a, it's a really simple point in verses 2 and 3, is that Jesus delights to heal the hopelessly broken. Jesus loves healing the hopelessly broken. Some of you here this morning, you came in hopeless, you came in dejected, you came in at the end of your rope, you came in wondering why you can't put everything together. Congratulations, you're in a great spot for Jesus to do awesome things in your life. In verse 22, we're going to learn that this man who was lame from birth was Excuse me, in in chapter 4, verse 22, we learn that this man, who was lame from birth, was more than 40 years old when this encounter happens. Verse 2 literally begins, And a certain man, consistently being lame from the womb of his mother. In other words, he had a congenital birth defect that rendered him lame. From conception To 40 plus years of age, he had never walked. In a society built on walking, they didn't have little limes that you could get downtown Jerusalem. Right? In a society built on walking, he had never taken a step. 
And the reality is this morning, we need to understand parenthetically that these sorts of things, congenital birth defects, disabilities, special challenges, they are the result of sin and they are a part of the reason that Jesus has come to bear sin and to begin the process that he'll complete when he comes when there's going to be a world where there's not going to be anybody who's lame. There's not going to be anybody suffering from a congenital birth defect. There's not going to be any more disease or sadness or cancer or sickness. Jesus came as an embryo conceived in Mary approximately nine months before Christmas to apply his healing and restorative power to every phase of the human life. Some of you have lost little babies in this room. You will see them and hold them again. Every aspect of human life has been impacted by sin and sometimes it shows up physically and The reality is it shows up physically for all of us eventually in this thing called human death. Did you know that death is not natural to the human experience? There's a reason you don't want to die. It's unnatural to the human experience. Death was introduced to our experience by sin, birth defects, tragedies, natural disasters, miscarriages, death. They exist in our world Because of sin. Now, I'm not suggesting for one moment that it was this man's personal sin that led him to have a congenital birth defect. That would be wrong-headed thinking. John 9 clarifies for that with the man born blind. Do you remember? Jesus is asked, who sinned? Was it this guy or his parents that sinned? And Jesus is like, you missed the point. Sin impacts everybody, but this guy was born blind. Why? So that the works of God might be displayed in him. And it's still true that we encounter people who are lame, who have special challenges, and God has placed them in our midst as the church so that the special works of God might be displayed in their life. We may not be able to raise them up to walk, but we can serve them in Jesus' name, and we can prove that Christ has a heart for the brokenhearted. The man in this passage had never walked. Through the apostles, Christ's healing power is about to be displayed in his life. And the reason this miracle is selected, and the reason that this man is is not named, he's just a certain man, is because if, if we had given him the name Bob or Joe or Tom, you might check out and say, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me. But Luke says it's just a certain man because he wants you to... Step into the story and recognize that apart from Jesus, you are the man. We were all born with a congenital birth defect. Just as this man was powerless to change his physical circumstances, we are all powerless to change our spiritual circumstances. His physical problem was hardwired into his DNA, and our spiritual problem is hardwired into our spiritual DNA. Paul says we are by nature children of wrath. We are born in Adam's sin, which means none of us comes out of the womb striving to walk with God. Instead, we come out ready to rebel against God. We come out incapable of knowing and enjoying and worshiping God as we ought. In other words, spiritually speaking, we were all hopeless. We were born with hearts that were incapable of communing with, knowing, enjoying, and walking with God. The depth of the brokenness of this man is shown by the mention of his immobility. He had to be carried to even beg for alms. He was carried to the temple daily, the text tells us. He couldn't move himself. He he never had a moment to himself. He had to be helped to his bed. He had to be helped to the bathroom. He had to be helped to do virtually any task that most of us would take for granted and we would consider routine. He's broken. His brokenness is also seen in his occupation. His life is a perpetual groundhog day. It just starts over the same thing day after day after day. Daily they they laid him at the, the beautiful gate, this beautiful gate outside the temple to where you would enter into the presence of God. 
with Corinthian bronze all over it. And he, he would see that gate and he would sit there among the dusty feet as they passed him day by day. And he would beg for alms. The man lame from birth has no way of moving himself and he has no way of supporting himself other than lying on the ground and crying out, watching those dusty feet, taking those seemingly perfect bodies through the beautiful gate to commune with God's people. He's an, he's an outsider. He's a nobody. But it just so happened on this day this particular day that he asked the right people for help. You see, what he's about to discover is that when you ask the right people for help, you generally get a different answer to your problem than you were expecting. He comes to the apostles, maybe they'll help me, sees Peter and John, and, and what we see in verses 4 and 5 is, is not only that Jesus has a special heart for those who are hopelessly broken, we see secondly in verses 4 and 5 that the broken often set their hope on the wrong solution. He wants money, not mobility. But the apostles want to bring in mobility. When Peter and John hear, hear this man asking for alms, they, they direct their gaze to him, at him, and they command him to look at him, which implies that the beggar didn't want to make eye contact. He was hesitant. He was embarrassed he was ashamed there's so much implied in verse 4 the the shame the embarrassment the resignation to his condition that he was he was never going to improve he was never going to be better apparently he assumed that he would be to Peter and John just another beggar easily dismissed and forgotten almost as soon as they gave him their spare change but this day was going to be different Peter and John don't just toss him some loose change and move along. Instead, they command him, look at us. Look at us. We have something far better than money for you. We have the transformational power of the Messiah. And yet, when he looks at them, it only heightens his expectation of a donation, his asking goes to expecting. He's like, if you're going to make me look at you, if you're going to make me look up to you and realize that you're whole and you're healthy and you can walk into those beautiful gates and I'm down here and lowly, if you're going to make me go through this charade, if we're going to bypass social convention and you're not just going to put a little tip in my jar and you're going to make me feel the embarrassment of this moment, then you better give me some, a good donation. Maybe you'll put enough alms in my cup today that I can go home early and actually get a little rest from this weary life before I come back and do it all over tomorrow. You better give me some money. This man is like so many in the world around us. Church, we live in a world filled with broken people. And they're looking for the wrong solution. They're just trying to get through another day. But the solution does nothing to resolve their brokenness. It does nothing to facilitate for them a walk with God. It's like giving them money when we could give them mobility. You may have walked or hobbled or wheeled yourself into this room this morning, but if you aren't walking with God, you are still broken. Let me say that again this morning. You might be able to walk just fine. You might have wheeled in here. You might have had a walker. You might have had a chair. You might have had... I don't know, a prosthesis, I don't know how you got here today or how you're going to get to where you're going tomorrow, but if you have mobility but you don't have a walk with God, you're still broken. And there's a lot of places that are offering a lot of solutions to brokenness that don't make a dime's worth of difference in your life. There's not enough pleasure there's not enough exercise at the gym. There's not enough parenting success. There's not enough marital bliss. There's not enough money. There's not enough fame. There's not enough status. There's not enough education or expertise or promotion or experience or rewards or likes or shares or retweets or follows in the world to heal a broken heart. You believe that, church? 
Do you believe that we have the answer for those who are spiritually immobile? Spiritual immobility is congenital. It is baked into our DNA from birth. And the only way for us to be healed is for the Holy Spirit to make us new on the inside through faith and Jesus. You'll never be good enough to have a walk with God. Your only hope is to run to Jesus. You'll never be good enough to hop into the baptistry. You'll never be good enough to partake of the Lord's Supper. It's not about what you can do. It's about what Christ has done and surrendering your life to it and receiving it and letting Him change your heart. And I'm here to tell you, church, when you do that, when the Holy Spirit opens the door of your heart to receive the miracle-working, transforming power of Christ on the inside, what we see in verses 6-10 through 10 is this. Jesus offers a healing that reaches the root of our brokenness. He doesn't, he doesn't just put makeup on the problem. He doesn't put lipstick on on the pig. He gets all the way down to the epicenter of our heart and he transforms it to make us receptive to the God we were made to serve. The lame man assumes that his legs and feet will never move. So he just wants money. He just wants to continue his current condition for another day, but praise God, Peter isn't carrying cash. By the way, that's not a bad policy, to not carry cash. As a pastor, a lot of people come by this church and they want something and I don't have any cash. But you know what I often offer to do? Take them to lunch, go buy their gas, and you'd be surprised how many times people will decline you taking them to do the very thing they said that you wanted, they wanted money to do. This day, Peter didn't have any cash. And if John had cash, he didn't give John a chance to say so. That's Peter being Peter for you, right? He's the leader. He's always out front. He's the spokesperson. We don't have any cash. But Peter stresses his lack of money, saying in verse 6, literally verse 6 reads like this, Silver and gold does not exist to me. But what I do have and keep on having, I give it to you. Isn't that amazing about the gospel? You get filled up with Jesus on the inside and it's like, well, i got to give him away. Guess what? You don't lose any Jesus when you give Jesus away. In fact, this is, ama this is amazing. You share the gospel with somebody and they come to saving faith in Christ and it's like, you got more Jesus too. You're like, how did that happen? He's the only thing you can give away and you get more of him in the giving away of him. It's awesome. I don't have any money. I don't have any silver, I don't have any gold, but i got a Savior that I want to tell you about. What I have, I'm going to give it to you. And what does Peter have? He, he has Jesus. And as an apostle, he can work miracles, not in his own power. This is not magic. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. This is not a, a magic formula that just anybody can go around and quote as though they can do the bidding of Jesus. He's a deputized witness and apostle. He, as an apostle, has access to the DNA-altering power of God in Christ. He is an authorized conduit to Jesus' power. It's not Peter's power. It's Jesus' power working through Peter to heal a man. Peter's role is that of a witness to the Israelites because Jesus has come. Israel needs to stop looking for the Messiah and start worshiping the Messiah who's already come and is seated at the right hand of the Father. In Isaiah 35, 6, there's a prophecy about the end times restoration of all things. The prophet says this, Then shall the lame man leap like a deer. Peter's about ready to fulfill some prophecy. Jesus, working through Peter, is about ready to prove that the end times in Christ have already arrived. We need to understand that. We can't simply command healing in the name of Jesus, right? We're not, we're not apostles, we're not apostolic delegates. But what can we do as the church today? We can confidently point the needy to the risen Lord. We can pray confidently for Him, for them in His name. When Kathy sent me a note from the hospital and said, I'm not sure I'm going to make it, I prayed in Jesus' name for her to be healed. 
I prayed with confidence that he could touch her body, that he could feel her, fill her lungs with oxygen, that she could walk again. Now, it took time, and it's been gradual, and I think you're still using some oxygen. But God is healing Kathy. And we have prayed in Jesus' name that he would do this. And we recognize that sometimes we pray for healing, and in this lifetime we don't see it happen. But for those who die in Christ Jesus, their bodies will be raised up, and they will be made whole. Because Christ has come, access to the end times restoration is underway And those who are made new on the inside will be there in the new heavens and the new earth. Although we don't usually see Jesus working directly through the church to grant immediate physical healing, He still allows us to work mercy ministries in our community. He allows us to bless people in Jesus' name. And He's still very much working through the church to bring spiritual healing to the lives of those who are far from God. The Holy Spirit is with us as we witness to Christ. He gives us the words of the gospel to speak in the very hour that we need them. And we, like Peter, can call those who've been spiritually born lame. And who is that? That's everybody. We were all born spiritually lame. We can call them to be reborn, to be born again, to be made new, to be transformed, to be regenerated by the Spirit through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as the church, what do we say? We say like Peter and John, we say to the spiritually lame, money will not heal you, but the Messiah will. We say to them, shopping will not cure you, But the Savior will. That's good to know after Black Friday, amen? Tomorrow's Cyber Monday. Some of you missed that deal and you're waiting for it to come up again. Did you know shopping might distract you for a while? But it won't solve the core emotional issue that drives you to binge shop. Leisure will never distract you long enough to make your problems disappear. But the Lord can give you new purpose and new power to walk with Him Fame will fail, but the faithful king never fails to keep his promise to those who trust in him. So like Peter, the church can call upon the spiritually broken that we encounter to rise up and walk. As I shared with you earlier, these words, rise and walk, are not accidental. Rise is the word that Jesus used when he goes to the little girl. You remember the little girl who's dead? And he's like, oh, she's just asleep. It's going to be all right. And they're like, you're crazy. She's dead, man. There's no breath. There's no pulse. She's deader than a doornail. And Jesus is like, hey, why don't you all go out for just a few minutes? And he says to her little girl, rise. The word of resurrection. It's not just getting up and walking. It's not being alive and then changing your ability to walk. It's actually being dead And then being given life. This man who couldn't walk, it was like he was dead. He couldn't go in and be with God's people. He couldn't get into the temple. He probably at times wished that he was just dead. He probably wished that he had never been born. And Peter says, I want you to rise to a whole new way of seeing and a whole new way of living. It's not just that I want you to get on your feet. I want you to rise. And in the power of God, that can happen. It can happen for some of you today. The word rise is also used of Jesus' own resurrection. When the ladies come from the tomb and say he's risen, it's the word of Jesus' resurrection. And get this, in Romans 6, 4, Paul puts the two words together, rise and walk. He puts them in the same verse. He says says this, we were buried therefore, he's talking about Christians. Christians. You were living your own life. You were living your own dream. You were living for your own thing, but you were far from God. And then he says this, but we were buried with him, with Jesus, by baptism into death. In other words, I died to myself. I died to my own agenda, my own dreams, my own ambitions. Why? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might do what? We might walk in newness of life. I trusted in Christ so that the healing power of His resurrection would be applied to my heart, that I would know Him in a new way, and I would be able to walk with Him in newness of life. Church, while we can't go around healing the lame, we can speak the gospel to 
weary souls and see the Spirit of God raise the spiritually dead to life. We can be confident that those who do rise and walk, even if they have physical challenges along the way, even if they die physically, they will be with us in the new creation and we will be with them. Why can we trust this? Because we know Christ will do as He's promised. He will return. And those that He makes new on the inside now will dwell with Him forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Paul says it this way, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Why do you need to be a new creation? So you can be prepared to dwell in the new creation. But it's not enough to just hear the gospel. It's not enough to read a story of a, an amazing miracle outside the temple. We have to receive the gift. Imagine you're this man. For a lifetime, you've, you've learned to accept defeat. You've learned to suppress the idea that you might walk one day. You've, you've learned to take that dream and consider it a nightmare. You know, as a pastor, I've seen a lot of people in the hospital. And you know when I get most concerned? is when they're bedridden for more than a few days. The human body can withstand a lot, but what really concerns me is when somebody has to lay there in that hospital bed for three days, four days, and then a week, and then ten days, and then three weeks and a month. Because with every passing day, those muscles atrophy. With every day, the, the rehab and the work that's going to be required to return to normal is exponentially greater than the day before. But with this man, he's never walked. There's no muscle to rehabilitate. There's no muscle memory to learn from and to restore. There's no underlying strength to work with that can be restored or repaired or rehabilitated. He is utterly broken. And this man, when Peter reaches down and takes his hand, we could forgive him if he pulled his hand away and said, no way, that's terrifying. We could forgive him if he said, not me, not yet. How in the world can I know? How can I trust that you'll change me? How can I trust that I won't collapse and hurt myself even more? We could understand if those things happen, but as Peter puts his hand down to take him by the right hand, all that we can tell from the text is he grabs hold. He grabs hold. And as Peter picks him up, his feet and his ankles, feet and ankles, which had never worked, were in, in, in an instant they were made strong. They were strengthened by God Almighty Himself. He didn't go to rehab. He didn't go to physical therapy. He didn't get a walker. He simply received God's healing by faith. And some of you today need to stop trying your own plan, your own agenda, stop bringing your own hesitations, and let the hand of God that's reaching down to you now through the preaching of the gospel, you just need to take it and you need to rise up up and walk but oh, what about this what about that just take his hand in verses 8 and 9 we read that this man you say well this was just a moment he was just excited and he was able to kind of like do something real quick oh no verses 8 and 9 he leapt up he stood he began walking he entered the temple with the apostles where what did he do he kept on walking and leaping and praising God and all the people saw him doing what walking and praising God three times in two verses he was walking he was walking he was walking twice in three in two verses he was praising he was praising church this is a picture of of why Jesus came. Can you imagine that whole time laying or in the dust by the dusty feet asking for alms and when he gets up and he looks and he sees the beautiful gate he's like I can walk in there. I've dreamt about what it might be like to go in there. 
The day that Jesus healed some lame people in the temple and they finally let some lame people in because Jesus overturned the money changers tables and he brought the lame people in to be in the presence of God and he healed them. How did I miss that day? I don't know, but the guys that carried me had already dropped me here and I couldn't get in and I heard about it, but Jesus is gone. They crucified him. Peter says no. He is risen. He has conquered the grave and his healing power is operative in the lives of people. Rise up and walk. And when his feet are restored or made whole for the first time in his life and he's leaping and he's praising, he, he sees that beautiful gate and he runs through it into the presence of God. And he gave him praise. There was nothing this man could do to save himself. And yet when God saved him, he could not do anything but walk and praise God, if you are spiritually broken this morning, if you know that you're not walking with God, if you know that you've been trying to fill your life with lesser joys than belonging to God, if you know that you've been trying all the answers that don't solve your problem, then I want to beg of you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, take his hand, rise, and walk. As you do, you'll be taking not only the hand of King Jesus, you'll be taking the hand of North Roanoke Baptist Church. We are ready to support you and to receive you, to welcome you as you stop living a life outside of the gates and you learn what it is to walk with God and to give Him praise. You say, well, that's crazy. It is. Look at verse 10. People are like, uh... That's that guy. Their seeing becomes recognition. There will be people, as you take the hand of Christ, who will wonder about the change in your life. They'll wonder what it is that God has done, and you will have an opportunity to do for them what Peter did for this man, to speak of the truth of Christ, and to see yet another person born spiritually lame, being raised to walk in the newness of life. This morning, if you don't know Christ, I want to encourage you to rise and walk. And if you do know Christ, I want to ask you a question. Do the people who see you recognize the change in your life? Do they see you walking and leaping and praising God? If not, today's a day of renewal. Our King is so gracious and so kind. Let's go to Him right now. God in heaven, we give you praise for the book of Acts. We give you praise for this healing of this man born lame. This man lame from his mother's womb. God, we thank you that you delight to heal those who are hopelessly broken. That though we seek answers that won't solve our problem, that you are the answer. And God, I pray this morning that if there's anyone in this room who's still trying to do it on their own, still trying to just survive in advance for another day, that God, you would break through and save them. That some would rise and walk. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living home. Who could 
could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin has spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living Spirit is not opposed to clapping. Did you know that? It's actually in the Bible. Uh, clapping and shouting. It's in there, I promise. What a, what a day. What a message. I don't know about you, but my, my mind is, is locked into that moment. Where Peter took his hand. 
and everything changed. God's still in that business. And the question I have for you as we go before I get to the announcements is this. Who do you know between now and Christmas that God has placed you in their life to reach out a hand and at least bring them to church? It's Christmas time. We got a Christmas Eve service at 530. I'll preach the gospel. You've probably figured out by now I'm going to preach the gospel every week we're here. But if everybody, I know we got couples and families, but if everybody brought one couple or family, I mean, we'd, we'd have to build a new sanctuary. Glory, hallelujah. So um, think about that today as you go. Who could I bring? Just one. Who could I bring? And now at this time, I want to make you aware of a few announcements before we go. First, uh, next Sunday here in at the close of service, we'll be voting on the proposed budget that was discussed at our most recent business meeting. If you want a copy of that proposed budget, it's available at the Welcome Center as you go. Uh, it's also, I believe, still available online. If you just scroll down to business meeting, it's right there under events on the website. Secondly, if you'd like to get some poinsettias in honor or memory of someone, you can call the church office, use the envelopes in the pew rack in front of you, and you will want to pick those up at the Christmas Eve service. Otherwise, I'll have a lot of poinsettias at my house. And I don't need that many poinsettias, but it does make the, the stage look beautiful for Christmas time. Thirdly, there is a women's event coming up on December the 4th with lunch provided. We ask that you register for that. You can do that, uh, I believe, through the app or online. Just look for events or featured events, and you can do that. I think we've got over 100 ladies coming. It's going to be an awesome time in the Lord. Uh, so please come on out for that. And then finally... Um, we're going to have sort of a, a vacation Bible school reprise from 10 to 2. Uh, stay tuned on that. We're going to have registration links available for that very soon uh, for you to bring your kids out. We unfortunately were interrupted by COVID this summer, so we're going to try again on Saturday, de December the 11th. So mark your calendars for that. Thank you so much for your tentative to tentativeness today. Uh, let's, let's go to the Lord. God in heaven, I give you praise for these people. I give you praise that you are king. You are King Jesus. You are ruling and reigning in righteousness. And through the proclamation of the gospel, you are restoring broken people. God, we pray that North Roanoke Baptist Church would be a lighthouse of hope. God, that, that the mercy ministry we, we do would be a, a foretaste of the kingdom that is coming in Christ. God, we pray that as we live our lives, that people would see that we're different, that we're leaping spiritually, that we're praising spiritually, that we're walking differently than the world. And we pray, God, that as the world sees that, we'd have an opportunity to say that Jesus made all the difference. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.